Welcome to the Freshman Foundation Podcast, helping you make the jump from high school athletics to the collegiate level and beyond with your host, Michael Huber. Hey everyone, it's Mike Huber, founder and CEO of the Freshman Foundation and certified mental performance consultant. If you're listening to this episode, then you're likely a student athlete or family member of one. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Hopefully you find our podcast valuable. Mental performance coaching allows young athletes to show up at their best every single day by conquering distractions, pressures, and mental roadblocks through evidence-based strategies. So let's talk. You can visit my website at Michael, V as in Vincent Huber, dot com to schedule a free strategy session. Let's see if mental performance coaching is a fit for your family. Enjoy this episode, and thank you again for listening. How does John Lannon help professional baseball players get to where they want to go by meeting them where they're at? Mental performance coaching is a delicate balance of art and science. While there are evidence-based strategies that have been proven effective, those same strategies must be tailored to the needs of each person. Understanding what makes athletes tick is often the secret sauce in helping them to get to where they want to go. My guest, John Lannon, is a certified mental performance consultant and former major league pitcher. He currently serves as a mental performance coach in the Toronto Blue Jays organization. In episode 35, John discusses how he applies his craft in the high pressure world of professional baseball. He also candidly shares how his experience as a former player can serve as both an asset and the liability when serving as a mental performance coach. I'm excited for this conversation. Let's build your foundation with John Lennon. Hey, John, what's going on, man? Not much, Mike. How are you? It's good to see you, buddy. It's, it's been a while. You. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's good to catch up. So we're going to jump right in and I'm going to ask you, what's a day in the life of a mental performance coach in Major League Baseball like? You know, I find myself wearing multiple hats, um, you know, because of my experience on the field, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things on the field. Um, and it's just really trying to find those organic touch points where you can, you know, do several things. It's either um, build relationships, um, mm-hmm. you know, that's probably the biggest thing that I do and just continuing to kind of build off of the the conversations we have. And then there's also the work, you know, it's, um, you know, we only get certain amount of time. So you got to be, you know, ready to work with a five minute, you know, conversation, because sometimes that's all you get at the beginning. So really just navigating that environment of, okay, I don't have these set one on one sessions. Um, it ultimately gets there. But at first, it's like just being around, um, observing, um, you know, and then it's a resource needed, not a resource force. So we really go by the pace of the athletes. Uh, you know, they're the expert on themselves. So we kind of let them kind of, they know what they need. Sometimes they just need a little bit of help getting it out, but it's usually just hanging out, um, being intentional in their work, uh, being laser focused and, you know, giving them stuff that they could use to get better on the field. So, I mean, Every athlete obviously is different, right? Have di- has different needs, like you said, and they have, I'm sure, different personalities and different, you know, sort of points of view on the work that you're doing. Like, but on average, like, like what's sort of like the timeline for getting someone to buy into working with a mental performance coach? That's a great question. Um, it depends on the motivation, I think, to, you know, apply the work. Uh, sometimes it comes quickly, sometimes slowly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's different depending on, you know, the clutter, I would say, like how much is there really the self-awareness to realize that this can benefit them. And sometimes the awareness is low and sometimes the awareness is like, I can really benefit from this. So it really varies and, um, it takes patience. Um, either way, you know, some, some of the hungrier guys, it's okay. Let's not bite off more than we can chew. The other ones, it's like, they have no uh, foundation. So it's really 
meeting them where they're at, um, not trying to fix it, not try to force it, but just be there with them and, and really be intentional in knowing where they're at. So how many of your athletes, I mean, you can answer this however you want, but how many would you say or guess that have some exposure to mental performance coaching before they come into the organization? I think as the drafts kind of go on, I think colleges are doing a better job of uh, supplying or supporting the athletes from a mental performance standpoint. So there's some guys that are coming in with, you know, either someone came in to talk to them um, frequently, or they had their head coach kind of make it an emphasis, or, you know, some places had counselors, you know, so it varies, but I think the players, especially college players are having more of a fundamental understanding of what mental performance is and how to have a routine that has that kind of stuff seeped in. Yeah. I would imagine it makes the work easier, right. In terms of if there's some exposure to it before they come into the organization, obviously the way that the blue Jays do it is going to be much more sophisticated on balance and probably they might have experienced in college or even high school, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the same idea, right? Like players who are kind of coming towards you saying, I need help or I want help. Um, Got to make the job a bit easier versus having to get them to buy in without having any exposure to it. Yeah. I, I, I don't even think it's a help standpoint. It's just a enhancing performance. They know that this, this is something they need um, and something mm-hmm. they do work as much as they want to so there are cases where they're like i need help like i'm kind of lost but there's other guys that are just like hey like i'm just trying i know this is important how can i do a better job of it yeah well it's interesting right you said use the word motivation and i'm finding that in my practice right i have the most success with clients who are motivated right? They're motivated to show up, to invest, to do the work. Uh, And if clients are not motivated, they're probably not going to do what they need to do in the process to get better, at least in the short term, right? It usually becomes, well, I'm having an issue or I'm having a problem or I'm, I'm in a slump or I'm in my head when they come forward and say like, hey, can you help me? Which obviously isn't always ideal to put that you know, Band-Aid on, as I would say, right? So like what sort of messaging is the organization giving or do you give as a coach individually to say, hey, like you got to work on this all the time, regardless of whether you're, you're going great or you're going, you're, your head's in the, in the tank. The biggest thing for me is applying it on field stuff. If, if, they're, if they yeah. can't see that connection, they're going to be out. But this might not answer the question, but it's a law of, thirds, right? There's going to be the bottom half that are not really, or the bottom third that are not really motivated. They got some guys that are a little bit ambivalent and then you got the guys that are really into it. And I think as you, as you start to work with the, on the ambivalence with the, which means they feel two different ways about something where they're kind of knowing that they need it, but they're also like, I don't want to do it. Um, once you kind of help those guys out, the goal is to kind of buy them being exposed to it, that bottom third can say, okay, maybe, you know, maybe there is something to it. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest message is whatever I'm doing, I'm connecting it to, this can help you be better on the field. And then a byproduct of that. And what's most important to me is off the field, who they are as a person, like identity stuff, really the, where the awareness really has to come in, where you understand your values. Um, so there's certain ways to get to that. And I mean, some people don't want that. Right. So it's once again, meeting them where they're at. But I, I, I think that I, I really try to meet them as a person rather than a player, but sometimes you're going through performance to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the rule of thirds is, is a great way to characterize it. Cause I think I see the same thing as well. Right. You know, not everybody is going to be engaged or into it or you see the value in it and there's really nothing you could do about it. Then you've kind of got that one third in the middle that could go either way, like you said. And then you got the one third who's like all in and you just got to think about how to invest your resources too. I imagine your time's not 
infinite, right? So you're you're probably gravitating towards the players who are really engaged in it because that's where you're going to get the most out of the process rather than trying to convince somebody that this is something you should be doing and you know they're not buying it. Yeah, and I, I don't want to not give that support and resource to those players. I've had plenty of times where I've gone up to a player and be like, hey, what's your experience with mental performance? And mm-hmm. like, no, I got it. I'm, I'm good. I'm like, great. Okay, that's that's awesome. Um, other guys, I'm like, we're getting some group together to do some breath work or mindfulness. And I invite some guy just off the hip, just be like, hey, you want to come join us? And he's like, no. <laughs> right? And then another guy is like, hey, have you ever really incorporated mental performance into your bullpens? Um, you know, and they're like, no. And then I kind of get into... Uh, this awareness of just like, what are you thinking when you're on the mound? And they're like, nothing. So when you get those kind of answers, it's like, okay, there's this resistance. And instead of like telling them, hey, you really need this, it's like rolling with that and being really patient and getting to know them and and finding a way to connect uh, in a non-forceful way. So, and all those three examples, um, those guys ended up, we ended up working together. Uh, some, one guy took a year, you know, to really open up, um, another one, you know, another guy by the end of this five months, you know, it's like, it comes, you know, sometimes quick, sometimes slow. Like I said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's, it's like the old, you know, John Wooden quote, right. They don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Right. And if you're being consistently showing up for them and being present and making an effort to, to get to know them and watch them and maybe point something out here and there where you're sort of observing and you help them, right? Like that's going to help build the trust, right? Because you're not just saying, well, you know what, I'm going to write this guy off because he said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stick it out and make sure that he knows that I get, give a shit about him, frankly. And, and that that's going to help build the relationship and ultimately earn, earn their trust. And that, I think that's probably the thing I miss the most being in an, you know, being in the dugout is just that like ability to be there all the time and not have to do anything but watch sometimes, you know, because, you know, in private practice, you don't always get the ability to observe the athletes you work with, which is a really a detriment. It's a real deficiency. It's a hard thing to, um, it's a hard thing to compensate for because you, you, they tell you one thing and you have to take them at their face value. But if you don't see, sometimes you see something totally different and you're like, well, hold on. Like, you're telling me this, but this is what I see. And like, mm-hmm. That that's a big part of practice is being able to see something that they can't see. In my limited experience working with private clients, or private athletes, you know, especially the younger, like uh, younger athletes, they'll tell you it, what's going on, but like it's always a f- not false, but more so a limited. You know, they don't really they think that's doing they're doing it, but they're really not. So I would work with the player, but then I was also in touch with the dad and the coach and I was getting mixed messages. And, you know, it's like that gentle conf- confrontation. Mm-hmm. Like without Seeing it, it's very hard for you to bring that up. Hey, I noticed something that, you know, we've been working on, but it's not really showing up on the field what's going on or so, you know, I, I kind of, I understand that struggle. Um, and I also mm-hmm. see the benefits. I've also, you know, I don't take it for granted the fact that I can be around um, more frequently, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, just being around the guys on a, on a day-to-day basis, not feeling you need to do the work, even though sometimes you're like, what the heck am I doing here? Am I even a <laughs> mental performance coach? Yep. But you know, the second I, the second I feel that, um, you know, the, I kind of just embrace it instead of forcing it and like being like, I need to do this. It's like, okay, be, be patient. Yeah. Be kind to yourself. You, the work will come. Just kind of make the most of where you're at. Yeah, I can. I completely relate to that because in my practice, right there's some days, and I was saying to this to you off, you know, before we started recording, is like there's some days where you're working all day and nothing happens, and you're like, am I? Is it even like? Is there any? Why did I even do this? Right. And but the way I help reframe it for myself is I'm investing. Right. I'm investing my time. And it's going to be an asset and it's going to pay off, right? And it's the same concept for you, right? Being there is not, not just because you're not doing anything doesn't mean it's not valuable, right? It just means that it hasn't paid off yet. And and I think that's what you just described, which is like, hey, I'm there, I'm watching, I'm there, I'm present. And 
tomorrow it's going to pay a dividend. It just hasn't paid a dividend today. But when you're in it, you feel like, what's my purpose here? I'm useless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, and what I, am I, I doing here? <laughs> I think that's a lot of the word, which is patience. You know, you hear that saying, and I'm stealing this. This is not something I've made up. But mm. like, you hear that saying, don't just sit there, do something. A lot of times it's don't just do something, sit there. Mm. Um, and I think that is something that's really important in the work, especially when you're dealing with motivation or, you know, getting these guys to trust you. You don't, you can't expect a guy to talk to their mental performance coach or go to a mental health professional every day of their lives. You know, it's usually right. once a week, you know, by month, whatever. So sometimes you need to, like, I can't do that either. You know, so it's like understanding those break times. How are you going to recharge for yourself? How are you going to practice what you preach by when there isn't something going on? You know, how are you getting better? And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing from a physical and mental standpoint. Like it's compound interest. Sometimes you don't really see the effects of the work you're doing until later. And that's like trusting the process. Right. So I have to do the same thing because I would never tell an athlete to do something that I haven't done myself. Mm -hmm. Um I just wouldn't do it. And I think I ex my experience as a ball player helps as well. But you mentioned it earlier, that consistently showing up and, and being, you know, short and punchy and giving them everything they need yeah. and nothing they don't. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that was going to be my next question. So you sort of headed me off at the pass here. Like how much does your experience as a, as a major league player impact what you do for good or <laughs> maybe for not so good? Well, I never tell players that I played. Um, it's just not my style. I don't want to lead with it because it's all about them. And I, I want to kind of know them and, and get them to get to know me and want to be around me without that. Because to be honest, like that is the biggest advantage I have is being able to play because I get that street cred, I guess, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. But I don't rely on that. You know, I, I know that that might get me in the door, but what gets me like that relationship is me, right? So obviously the the playing aspect helps and guys are just like, okay, I'll, I can talk to that dude just because he's been there, mm -hmm. but I also have to deliver. You know, no one wants to hear stories about back when I played, uh, this is what it was like, or this is what I did. <laughs> that just doesn't go far. Uh, they need to be able to apply what's going on to their lives. So how has your experience as a major league baseball player like helped or maybe hurt or not helped your work? Yeah. So I, I never really lead with the fact that I played, I, um, they end up finding out one way or another, but I think, uh, I, I don't force this, but I think I have tried to embody this is this humility of, you know, it doesn't matter that I played, I'm here for you. And, um, you know, by nature, I'm going to get that extra additional buy-in because I did play. And I think players are like, Hey, this guy knows what's up because he's been there, but there's by no means do I rely on my career or, or say, Hey, when I played, this is what I did. You know, guys naturally ask questions, but I also, you know, sometimes be like, Hey, what, what do you think? Like if they ask me a certain question about what do you do when you really felt the pressure or you kind of got distracted? I'm like, what do you think I did? Um, you know, so regardless of my playing career, it gets me through the door, but as far as building that relationship, that becomes part of like who I am and, and how I go about the work. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really important thing, right? It's a very fine line between, establishing the credibility of like, Hey, I know this game and I've been in your shoes versus making it about you and not them because that could turn somebody off in any context really fast. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I, I guess it's something you probably think about all the time. So, you know, one thing is I struggle with in, in my practice or have at least in the time that I've been doing this is, you know, how and when to, to kind of use self-disclosure, right. To tell people about, my own experiences. Is that something that comes up for you in terms of the work that you're doing? Yeah. I, I think at first when I was, I first started off, there's a lot of times where I would think of situations and really um, like my first reaction is like, Oh, I've been there. Let me tell them what I did. But I think now I've learned to uh, balance my experience with the, the schooling and the, um, that actual work. And, 
it actually helps me empathize. You know, that empathy is a big piece being like, and I'm able to feel that emotion because even though our experiences are different, I think the underlying emotion is there. And I think that allows me to meet, like to put myself in their shoes, but all, to make it about them, you know, it's cause I can, I can feel that struggle because mm-hmm. I have been there, but ultimately it's not about my struggle. It's about their struggle. So it's like, uh, I can, I can feel the emotions. I know that feeling, but I don't try to, I, I really don't put it on my career. Yeah, that makes sense. So you talked about, like you mentioned briefly, the mindfulness or breathing exercises. Like what are some of the skills that you are teaching on a day-to-day basis with the players? And obviously it varies by person and situation, but like just in general, like what are some of the things you're teaching? So as a department, mental performance, we kind of operate out of kind of three buckets. One is acceptance commitment training, where we really work on accepting thoughts and feelings and stuff as they are, not really being happy with them, but understanding that, you know, there's a lot of things out of our control and we're going to think all the time. So it's more of accepting that. And then, you know, how do we get to committed action? So there's this mindfulness piece of spending time with the moment and kind of seeing it, how it unravels and not trying to change anything. But that actually, that ends up helping players get to this point of knowing what they need to do to get better. Um, that's one thing. And then the idea of motivational interviewing, um, this, this kind of working with players who are kind of stuck in this in between when they're trying to make a behavioral change, you know, is it something, should I stay where I'm at or do I make this change? And sometimes that could be scary. So really helping people navigate that space. And then, you know, based, and then there's, you know, the more like the breath work, you know, just mm-hmm. really working on like either it's Wim Hof or, you know, box breathing, mm-hmm or whiskey bread, like a lot of those things. So we do a lot of different uh, recovery, uh, like modalities. Um, Yeah, so it works different. And then it's more the uh, bibliotherapy where we just read a book and these stories, they can kind of input themselves in, like place themselves in the story. And, you know, that's more of a, I've had some really cool conversations where there's this like natural, we'll go into a Ryan Holiday book or, chop wood, carry water. And these yes. guys can like, it's such a cool thing where we dive into chapters and I kind of bring questions to them and they kind of go for it. So books like, uh, obstacles away, ego is the enemy. Courage is calling, uh, by Ron Halliday. These books are short chapters and the guys can kind of take things away from it that are kind of like applicable and they can like be like, okay, this makes sense. Uh, and just using questions to kind of draw that kind of stuff out. That's something that I have not done a lot of, but I've thought about a lot into the bibliotherapy, right? Reading a book is a way to, 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 um, implement the strategies and understand how it works. Right. So chop wood, carry water is a great example of a book that, um, one of my clients who's now a sophomore pitching at Duke, I use that with him because Duke's pitching coach was on a podcast. Who's now with, I think he's with the Cardinals, um, Dusty Blake, but he talked about that book and they used that book with incoming freshmen at Duke. And I read the book and I was just like, this book is absolutely ideal to use with any athlete because it's about the process of being great and the struggle and the story it's, 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 it's short, but it's amazing. It, it applies to the journey of any athlete where they could put themselves in that character's shoes and say like, oh, this is what it looks like for me. It's not going to happen today or tomorrow or this year. It's going to take four years, 10 years, 15 years to get to where I want to go. And if I don't embrace that process, it's going to be really hard for me to get to, to where I want to be because it's just going to beat me down. For sure. And it, that book has so many great, like, I guess skills, right? It talks about authenticity, values, talks about gratitude. It talks about trusting the process, overcoming mm-hmm. failure, being content with where you are when you're battling where you want to be. Um, and then ultimately you find yourself being both. You want, you know, you feel yourself being John and you feel yourself being the sensei. Um, you ultimately want to be your own sensei. 
So uh, that's a really cool book to dive into. And mm-hmm. uh, I've done it a couple of times where, you know, it's been in a camp setting or just, uh, you know, a couple of guys going through post-op from Tommy John. It's just mm-hmm. these things that when you're not doing as much work on field, you can really utilize the time and get into a book. And, and um, yeah, I, I love it. That's probably one of my favorite things to do with players. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's a good reminder to me that's something I should be doing more of. <laughs> and that, I think that book is a staple. I love Ryan Holiday too. And I think those books are incredible in terms of the messaging about, you know, really embracing challenges and using them to, as the path to improvement versus looking at it as a roadblock that's going to stop you from doing something. Um, so I'm going to kind of shift gears a little bit now. Um, so talk to me about your time as a player, right? As a younger player, right? High school, college, like what, what did that look like for you in terms of, you know, where you wanted to be, the way you thought about things, your process, recruiting, all those stuff. I'm just kind of a big question, but like, just tell me about some of that, that stuff you went through when you were a younger, younger lad. Yeah. I mean, I was never the standout player in high school. There was, if I went to a showcase or even my junior and senior year of high school, there was always guys that were, you know, I, I know uh, that's the only way I can put it. There was, you know, these Uber prospects that were going to go first round and I was kind of there, you know, I, I, I loved the game. I was passionate about it. I might've been limited by my strength and my stuff at that time, but luckily I, I mean, long story short, I was at a tournament where everybody was there to see the starter and I came in and did well. And that's how I got my shot with the, uh, with Siena college and, you know, kind of same process. And in college, I wasn't the dude, I got like a partial scholarship. There was guys on full rides and, you know, I just showed what I could do. And ultimately my junior year of college, we, I pitched in the first game of the Mac tournament and a, a scout was there from the nationals and I did well. So from there, I think that's the game that really got me drafted. And then again, you know, I got into pro ball and, you know, I wasn't the guy again. And my first two years I struggled. Um, I wanted to be out. Like I was looking at internships. I was, uh, you know, just, it wasn't apparent to me that I was, you know, going to make it. Uh, but you know, I had some support. I can remember one phone call from that same scout that drafted me or was very instrumental in that. And he said, Hey yeah. man, we, we want you to come out to early spring training. Um, and we believe you can kind of do some really great things for this organization and make it to the big league. So that kind of boat of confidence really helped. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to, I think what we were talking about before, you know, feedback, right? Having somebody validate the idea that all the work and energy and effort you've put into a process is paying off at some level. Cause if you don't get, get that feedback from some, you know, listen, we all want to be internally motivated completely, right? We want to wake up every day and say, I'm going to go out and do this. But like the truth of the matter is it's just not sustainable, right? In a lot of levels. And to have somebody make that phone call and tell you like, Hey, we believe in you is, is really important. So how did that sort of, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but how did that underdog mentality help you as a player? I mean, it kept me hungry. Um, you know, I got used to using doubt, uh, to motivate me. And, you know, we talked about it earlier. It's like Mm -hmm. before the podcast started, like that's a pretty good motivator, you know, doubt as long as it's processed the right way. And I think that's what I, that's what we focus on with players, like not trying Mm -hmm. to, um, get rid of doubt, but understanding what that feeling is trying to tell you and how it can be used and helpful. Um, and you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand that process, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it, but that's what it was. Like there was that doubt, but I kept on going and I kept on doing what I could. And then it'd be like, these little things would happen. Like, Oh, I'm getting drafted. Oh, I'm going to the big leagues. It's like, I didn't see it coming at all because like I was so focused on, 
you know, doing everything I can because I always doubted that I would make it, you know, from that because everybody doubted me for so long. Uh huh. So it kind of goes back to what you were saying before about the philosophical approach of the Blue Jays in terms of mental performance, which is to say, you know yourself best. I mean, what, what I what I was thinking when you were saying, giving that answer was like you were your own mental performance coach. Yeah, I I think I was, and then I worked with somebody too. You know, right before I did get you know called to the big leagues that off season. You know, I, my my dad noticed that I was struggling. Uh, in low A, you know, I, every time a guy got on base, that guy was scoring in my head. I was like, guy got on. It's like, there's nothing I can do. So I really started focusing on the mental aspect and it, it just paid off. You know, we kept it simple. It was like breathing rhythm posture. Like mm-hmm. those are the only things you can really control. And, you know, with some help from a, uh, mechanical standpoint, I just went with it. So yeah, I kind of was, but from a very basic understanding, I didn't, I kind of didn't overthink about it either. It's like, how do you think about your thinking and then not? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's where they're at. Cause we want to do those skills off the field. But once you get on the field, it's like, no, I'm going to fully commit. I'm fully going to trust and just let it all on the line. And I balance, you can't, use those skills that you use off the field on the field. Yeah. Well, I I mean, but that's to me, that's probably in working with young people. And I guess the people that I work with maybe are a little bit younger in general, high school kids are a little bit younger than what you're dealing with in the system. But to me, that's one of the hardest things to, 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 to teach is that commitment process, right? The acceptance commitment process, because so many young athletes are so, um, programmed to, um, uh, respond to results. And there's this underlying perfectionism in almost every athlete that I deal with. They can't, it's hard they can, but it's hard for them to really embrace at least up front the idea of just committing to the process and letting the, letting go with the result, which the paradox is, is that if you do that, you're probably going to get better results, but they can't let go of the result. And so unwinding that becomes really, really difficult at times. I mean, do you see any of that in your work? Well, I see it in myself. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> True, me too. <laughs> yeah, and then I see, I see it in my son, you know, who's mm. eight and playing baseball and it's all this outcome. And I think we're naturally going to look at that because it's what we can see. Yep. You know, it's like... Uh, I'm going to do this. And if I'm good at it, I'm going to feel better about it. But if I'm struggling and I don't see the results right away, I think naturally we're going to like want to not do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the place you need to, we, we try to get to, especially with myself is, all right, I did everything I could up to this point. Now it's out of my hands. Like I need to completely trust it. If I fall flat on my face, I'll learn from it. Right. But until I get to the point where I can completely let go, I can't really make the most of the moment. Yeah. And I think you you touch on a really good point, you know, as I'm reflecting on some of the stuff that I do with my clients and I tell them this a lot is to say, like, have you really done everything you can do? Right. And I don't think a lot of times they, they can answer that question honestly and say, yes. Right. And so I'll say, if you don't do this thing, it's okay, right? That's your choice. But don't be surprised when the result's not what you want it to be. And I think that gives them the permission to look at the situation and say, like, do I really want to do this? Right? Because you know what? Like, it's not my job. I'm not a coach. I'm not there to like make them perform a certain way and get a result because I'm looking for a W. Like, that's not what I do. And I think that that's one of the beauties of the work that we do, which is to say, hey, listen, man, it's your choice. It's your life. You can do whatever you want, but you got to look at it honestly and say like, am I doing everything I can? And the ones that do probably get to that point faster where they can say like, you know what, man, I've been doing everything I can and now I'm just going to let it rip versus the the ones that know subconsciously at a minimum, hey, like I could, I could probably be better at this, but I'm not doing it. So like I shouldn't expect anything differently. Yeah. And I think uh, we can't promise results. Um, we, I, I just, that's the, that's the, I guess that's the holy grail, right? How can you 
show that the work you're doing is ultimately impacting performance. Mm-hmm. I think you can get to a point where regardless of the results, you could be at peace with it and, and process the failures in a, in a, in a helpful way. Yeah. It's funny. I was reading an article, a study recently, <laughs> exactly on that. So it was a study. I don't know. You may have seen it actually given that you're in the organization, but it was a study about, and I think it was a thesis. So maybe not about, what's the benefit of working with a mental performance coach in professional baseball? Like that was the the foundation of the study. And what it found was it doesn't statistically, it doesn't improve performance, but what it does improve statistically significant is duration of career. What does that mean? The study basically said people who work with mental performance coaches got better at enduring failure and dealing with the adversity and their careers were two and a half years longer in systems because of it. And so that's exactly what you just described, right? We can't guarantee results, but we can make people mentally tougher, if you want to use that phrase, which I don't love, but just sort of came out, to, to, to stick it out because baseball is, to use a cliche, a game of failure. And if you can't deal with the adversity and the failure that comes with it, you're going to burn out and you're going to be like, screw this, I'm moving on because I can't take the way that it makes me feel. Yeah, I think ultimately it's helping them see what the right choice is, right? Because our choices matter. And yes, we do that through clearing out all the clutter and not getting too focused on what happened and what's going to happen. It's like, what's the best choice? How, what can I do now to make me better? Um, and I think that's what makes your career kind of go as long as it's supposed to is because you're making the right choices from a clear mm-hmm. mind and uncluttered heart. You know, it's like, like clear mind, focused heart, whatever, however you want to say it, it ultimately leads you to make better choices. Mm-hmm. And when you make better choices, you know, you're, you're ultimately going to make the most of whatever. And it's, you, it might, you know, extend your career by a couple of years. Yeah. How much work do you do with purpose in terms of understanding why players are doing what they're doing in, in your work? I would hope it's all the work I'm doing. Uh, there's never a conversation that I'm looking at, uh, you know, what's the purpose of this conversation? Uh, how am I using this time wisely? Mm-hmm. You know, as the relationship develop, I, I think it's okay to be like, there's really nothing really to work towards. I'm just going to be here and be comfortable with, this is just a conversation. There's other times where this light bulb goes on and I'm like, okay, this is an opportunity to help them see how they can get better. And that's when the purpose really comes out. But I think everything has some intent, some purpose behind it. Yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent. You mentioned your son, you mentioned your father. So I'm curious about, your relationship with your dad and what that looked like, or your parents, what that looked like as you were developing as a baseball player, right? Like what their role was, how they handled things. That's such a big part of the work that I'm doing in terms of understanding parent child relationships. It's a big driver of how I get clients. It's a big driver of like how I, you know, you know, work with my kids to see that relationship. It has a huge influence. So what did that look like for you when you were growing up? My parents did everything they could to make sure I was making the most out of my talents. They noticed something Mm -hmm. and they cultivated that. The only thing that, you know, my parents did their best, right? Yep. When I did face obstacles or challenges, they helped me Mm -hmm. like more than they probably should have. They, if I, you know, not to get too much into you know, the troubles I had as a kid, but they really did a lot for me. And I relied on that, you know, so I, even though I might've had the initial feelings of that, I never really learned how to, how to cope with that or process it in a, in a helpful way. So when I did meet obstacles later on, that might be a little bit heavier. I didn't have the skills to handle that. Uh, so like I said, my parents did my their best to support me, but sometimes that looked like they were kind of 
you know, like a Zamboni, they were just clearing the path ahead of me mm. where everything was smooth sailing and kept me like super focused, but I didn't deal with anything else. Whereas yeah. my son, I want him to a fault to experience that and, yes. and be there to support him, but through finding the strength within him yeah, to be able to overcome that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I listen, and I think that that for any parent, myself included, that's the biggest struggle we have. We want the best for our children and to get to a place where we could step back. And I like to use the phrase, take our hands off the wheel and let them just go through the crap and deal with it and process it their own way without trying to get over involved. I mean, it's really hard to stay out of it. Right. And, and so, you know, I see that all the time. And it's like, you want to give your kids the best resources and you want to make sure that they're doing everything they can to get to where they want to go. But at some point you can overdo it. Right. And almost do a disservice because you don't know how to deal with it on your own. How did that specifically when you left home and went to college, how did that manifest itself? That sort of like, now I'm on my own and I got to figure this stuff out and my parents aren't here. And like, did it, was it like, did it change? You know, when I, when I first heard you were doing this, I loved it because I think that was something that I really battled with. Yeah. I, the transition from high school to college, like I had this freedom that I didn't know what to do with it. And without my parents kind of keeping me in check, I was just kind of, you know, mm-hmm. didn't have direction when I first started college. Um, it took me a couple of years to kind of make that uh, transition, but I, I ran into some trouble in my college career, you know, mm-hmm. because that freedom, I didn't know what to do with it. I I didn't have those healthy boundaries to know, like, this is what you shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And this is what you probably should do. Uh, it took me a while. And um, yeah, if I had had, if I kind of had some skills going into college and knew how to navigate that freedom, I think I would have, I don't want to change anything, mm-hmm. but looking back, there's obviously things I knew I could have done better. Yeah. I mean, that was always my hypothesis, but you know, everybody's different and it's a lot easier to look back in retrospect and say, oh, I wish I would have had this versus like now it's like, well, well, why do I need this? You know? And I think that that's, I mean, that's a struggle in the, in the work that we do. I think in general is that idea that we've got to prepare for things that are to, to come. And if we don't know what's to come, you've got to put faith in the process that I'm preparing for something. And I think if you can't see it to sort of use your you know example before about baseball, like if you can't see the results, like what the hell, right? I think if you can't see what the future has to hold, like, well, well what am I prefer- preparing for? You know, like, well, if I work on my swing a thousand, I swing the bat a thousand times or I throw a hundred pitches today, well, I know I got better. But if I put in, you know, 50 mental reps, what's it going to do for me? I have no idea. Right. So yeah. we just gravitate to the tangible. And being on the other side of playing, I realized that a lot of my uh, failures are helping me more than any of my successes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it puts things hopefully in perspective that sport, my sport identity is not everything. And that what I'm going through yeah. now is ultimately going to make me a better husband, father, brother, son, whatever your other roles are. And your next job, you know, because you went through what you did to, through in sport, whether you handle it the right way or not, that experience is going to help you in the future um, with whatever you face, hopefully. Yeah. I, I think it does in some form or fashion, right? But I think how you frame it, right? Some people are a- able to really look at those failures and say, wow, man, this made me who I am. And I think some people don't have that innate capability. They look at the failures and they beat themselves up over it and say, I wish I should have done this and that differently. And they sort of focus on the past. So it just depends on everybody, which sort of comes back full circle to the work that we do, which is you've got to meet each person where they're at individually and there's no cookie cutter. And I think that that's the hardest part sometimes in communicating the value of what what we do is to say that it's not going to work the same for everybody. Not every skill is going to work for everybody. Not every, right. There's no like formula. And I think that makes people uncomfortable because then they're saying, well, why am I investing my time in this? 
and I don't know what I'm going to get back out of it. So, but that's life. And that's, you know, we carry the message on and hope people will, will follow us. Um, so, I mean, I guess that this, I would, I would sort of ask the same question about how did it manifest when you went from college to professional baseball? You know, I, I think those first couple of years, right. It's a transition. I don't think I transitioned very well. Mm -hmm. It's just a new culture, a new way of living. You know, I'm now, this is my job. Um, yeah. but that transition, you know, playing every day, throwing every day, being on the, on the road, mm -hmm. you know, you're kind of thrust into it and you know, those transitions really, it took me some time. Yeah. So in terms of like what it looks like now in the organization that you're in the Blue Jays versus when you were drafted, you know, 15 years ago, um, like, does it look different in terms of the programming or the training that incoming athletes get in terms of Ma uh, navigating those transitions? Yeah, they have uh, draft camps where they come in and they're kind of given the heads up what to expect mm -hmm. and kind of some baseline education and skills to kind of navigate what's ahead. Um, so yeah, before it was like, okay, here we go. He just figure it out. And now the player support is unbelievable. Um, and if a, if a guy's having trouble with it, you know, they have a lot of different resources, whether it's a, a dietary concern or working out or, you know, mental performance, you know, there's a lot of things that they can go to, to, you know, learn how to kind of cope with what's going on. Yeah. I mean, we've evolved so much in that respect and having those resources and making them, very known and obvious up front is a big part of it, right? It's the, the landscape has changed so much for the better, um, but it's still evolving, right? Not every organization in Major League Baseball has the same holistic model that the Blue Jays do. Yeah, and that's what drove, like, kind of drew me to the Blue Jays. Mm -hmm. There, I just sensed something was different than anything I ever experienced in professional baseball. Not to say the other organizations were bad. It's just they were like the Blue Jays were doing something different from Mark Shapiro down to, you know, every coach they hired. They all kind of had this common like drive, you know, these values that seeped into everything they did. And it was just the way they did it, you know, this Blue Jays way, this compete together, um, mastering yourself and being a good teammate everybody kind of was in stride with those things and it was so awesome to see that. And that's still mm -hmm. to this day apparent. And that was, that's what makes me, you know, I go into work every day ready to go because I know everybody there is on the same page and we are going to collaborate and we're going to learn. Um, and it's just, it's a really cool thing that the coaches do and the players are used to it. You know, this is the way they do things. Yeah. Yeah. It's a culture. Yeah. That's, uh, that's my favorite part of the work is understanding like how I could benefit the group, you know, find my place in it and how do I impact it in a positive way? How do I help build the culture? Uh, sometimes it's me just starting necessary conversations based on what I see. And other times it's really empowering the players to take things and make it their own. Yeah. So, um, it seems like the Blue Jays are the blueprint, if you will, for what the standard is in Major League Baseball now in terms of what other teams are striving to achieve. And I know there are other organizations that sort of kind of fit into that bucket too, but it seems like the ones that maybe are a little bit further behind the curve are looking at what you're doing and saying like, hey, this is what we want to be. Yeah, I think the whole community of mental performance in baseball it's kind of united and mm -hmm. we're all pulling for this to be, you know, at the best level it could be. So, you know, there's a lot of helping each other provide just the best resources. So it's not one, Hey, we got to yeah. be like them. It's like, uh, 
right? We know based on the industry standards, what we need to do to provide this awesome like resource. And it's either like CMPC certified, whatever we need to do. Mm -hmm. And it's a really cool community to be a part of where we're all pushing each other and we're realizing where this, this whole field was and now where it is. And we have to keep that, even mm -hmm. though we're working with different organizations, we're still working toward that common goal. Yeah. And it seems that way. And there's a lot more good publicity out there, PR about mental performance in major league baseball in terms of exposure. And that's only going to help. I think the, the momentum to, to build those resources, you know, at a standard that every club has um, a couple more questions and I'll let you move on with, move on with your day. So I, I have to ask one uh, baseball career related question. So like, when you look back on your career now, like what do you look back on most fondly? Like what's like, what's the, the thing you look back and say, man, I'm just so grateful that I had that in my life. That's a, that's a great question. You're going to have to give me a little yeah. bit of time to think of that. <sighs> First thing that came to mind was just those moments where I was super appreciative of where I was, whether, you know, it was at, the home park or away, you know, there was times where the crowd got so loud and I was at the pinnacle of it, you know, and it was just this like gratitude and just being there and taking it all in and realizing this was a childhood dream achieved, you know, not many people get to do that where I want to be a baseball player since I was a young kid. And that same feeling I got when I was at Yankee games is the same feeling I got when I would pitch. So um, that connection to that childhood dream and, and really just taking in that energy is something that I'll cherish forever. Good answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got goosebumps when you were giving the answer. Cause I think every kid who plays baseball, you know, at, at a certain level wants to be a pro and, and very, very, very few get to experience that. And so looking at that with gratitude and saying like, man, I got to do something that most people don't get to do. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, last question. So I ask this question all the time, like for anybody who's listening, whether it's a parent, an athlete, like what's the one, like if you had to give one piece of advice to somebody who wants to be better, like what would that piece of advice be? And this, I think this is my go-to answer to that question recently. Um, it's knowing where you want to go, like having that, holding that loosely and then doing any, everything you can in that moment to get there. So you, we're, when we talk about moment and out of results, that doesn't mean you don't have attention to that. Like you don't know where you want to go. It's like, how do you know where you want to go, what you're working towards? And then realizing that today is all I can really focus on. Right. Right. The word that comes to mind there. And I, I, I teach this as well as alignment, right. Is what you're doing aligned with what you want. And if you're doing that every day in service of that long-term vision, then you've succeeded, right? Because it's not going to happen today. It's going to happen five years, 10 years down the line. But if you did everything you could, there you go. Great answer. Yeah. And I, I think just the second follow-up to that is knowing what you value. Like, what is it about what you want to achieve? What how would that be in touch with your values? And as long as you know your values, that compass is going to be heading, you know, north to where it wants to go. I think we get so caught up in emotions. It gets us away from what we want to do. If we listen too much to that voice, it can kind of pull us away. But if we stay true to our values, um, that's ultimately going to get us to where we want to go, regardless if we get there. Excellent. All right. So we'll, we'll end on that note. John, thanks so much to come on. It was great to see you again. Uh, I miss you. And uh, <laughs> let's uh, hopefully when the world one day becomes normal again, let's uh, come down to spring training and say hi. For sure, man. I'd love to have you. All Good right. to see you, man. Take care. So what was your biggest takeaway from my conversation with John Lennon? For me, it's that the best mental performance coaches make it all about the athlete and how they can apply mental skills training on the field. As John suggests, this often occurs when we meet athletes where they're at. My suggestion to young athletes is to make the most of all the resources at your disposal. 
Not everyone has access to mental performance coaching. If you do, then take advantage of it to help attain your long-term vision. I want to thank John for his kind generosity and the wisdom he shared with the Freshman Foundation community. To learn more about how mental performance coaching can help your mind work for you rather than against you, visit michaelvhuber.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back in two weeks, ready to get better. Mike Huber is the founder and owner of Follow the Ball Coaching, located in Fairhaven, New Jersey. He is a mental performance coach and business advisor dedicated to serving athletes just like you reach their full potential on and off the court. The Freshman Foundation is all about helping you get to the next level. For more information, follow along on Instagram at the Freshman Foundation. Please subscribe. Give us a like on iTunes, Spotify, leave a review, tell a friend. Most importantly, come back in two weeks. Ready to get better.